I'm Ba Mahdi, um, Advanced OB Fellow, and I'm going to talk to you about shoulder dystocia today. It's a very common complication. I wouldn't say very common, but I would say that it's very common to upset us in the labor and delivery sometimes. So my educational objectives would be, uh, as you see here, that you early recognize and you timely diagnose shoulder dissociate confidently, and you follow a systematic and structured approach, and uh, you make sure that because of uh, the associated medical legal uh, implications of this problem, you need to know how to document very well uh, such a complication. So I'm going to start by definition, and unfortunately, in the literature, I find a lot of confusing definitions. There is no consensus agreement on definitions, but uh, it's the term used when uh, the situation where one or both shoulders are trapped above the pelvic, the pelvic brim after the head has delivered. There are uh, always, uh, almost always, it's only one shoulder, the anterior fetal shoulder, that's impacted against a bone, which is a symphysis pubis, or a much rarer that the both shoulders are stuck above the pelvic rim with the posterior shoulder held up by the sacral promontory. So clinically, it's defined by how, like this is a definition in the textbook, but clinically how to diagnose it, that it's an ability of the fetal shoulders to deliver spontaneously with maternal efforts alone or with gentle axial traction and make sure that it's not a downward traction. I'm gonna show you how this is different than the downward traction on the fetal head in a vaginal cephalic delivery. So any additional obstetric maneuvers are needed to deliver the shoulders and the body. It should be considered a case of shoulder dystocia. So it's a bony impaction. That's very important to understand the pathophysiology of this condition that the shoulders, the head already is delivered, but the shoulders are stuck. In order for the shoulders to be delivered, it should uh, come to the oblique diameter. But if the shoulders are in the anteroposterior diameter, that's the problem. So when the shoulders are stuck in the anteroposterior diameter of the pelvis and not rotated to the oblique diameter where this condition is. So it occurs when either the anterior or less commonly the posterior fetal shoulder impacts on the sacral promontory. So either the anterior fetal shoulder is impacted on the maternal symphysis, which is a bone, obviously, or the posterior fetal shoulder less commonly impacts over the sacral promontory. There are factors adding to this. It might be in diabetic mothers where the bisacromial diameter of the baby is large relative to the biparietal diameter or when the pelvic brim is flat rather than being gynecoid, it adds to more to the problem. So incidence, because the definition, there is no consensus definition, so the incidence is very variable in literature, but let's say overall it's about 1% of all vaginal births. And the incidence increases with increasing birth weight. So if the birth weight is between four kilograms to 4.5, the incidence is 5%. It goes up to 10% if the birth weight is 4.5 to 5 kilograms. If it exceeds 5 kilograms, the incidence is very, very high, which is 20%. We need to address also that it's in spontaneous vaginal delivery, it's less than 1% incidence, while if you perform an assisted vaginal delivery, it goes up to 2%. So we have two types of shoulder dystocia. We have the bilateral and the unilateral. The bilateral is the rare cause and both shoulders would fail to engage. And more commonly, it's, it happens with a mid-pelvic assisted delivery. And it's most difficult usually needs cephalic replacement. And that's a very sad photo for a baby with bilateral herbs palsy. Unilateral shoulder dystocia, this is the most common that we encounter, and the anterior fetal shoulder usually stuck behind the symphysis pubes, and it's usually dealt with the standard initial maneuvers that I'm going to talk about later. So the question is, can shoulder dystocia be predicted? And unfortunately, risk assessments for the production are insufficiently predictive to allow prevention of the large majority of cases. So the difficulty comes here when it's unpredictable and unpreventable. So there is a relation between the fetal size and the shoulder dissocia, but unfortunately, again, it's not a good predictor. Conventional risk factors predicted only 16% of cases that resulted in infant morbidity. 
And most cases occur in children of women with no risk factors. So it's largely unpredictable event. And they find that most of the prenatal and antenatal risk factors are interrelated with fetal macrosomy. So what are the risk factors? We'll divide it into preconceptional, antenatal, and intrapartum risk factors. Preconceptional, previous shoulder dystocia, when the mom is obese, high BMIs, high pre-pregnancy weight is a risk factor. Pre-existing diabetes is a very important risk factor. Then it comes other factors like you could guess when the mom is short or there is an abnormal pelvic anatomy or there is, the mom is multiplicous. Antenatal risk factors are excessive maternal weight gain, macrosomia, gestational diabetes or pre-existing diabetes or the post-term and induction of labor also would come for the intrapartum risk factor. So intrapartum, whenever we could find any protracted or arrested active phase, protracted or failure of descent of the head, prolonged second stage, or a need for mid-pelvic assisted vag delivery, it sh you should anticipate shoulder dissociation and you work accordingly. This condition is not without complications, so there are consequences on the mother and on the baby. So maternal complications in one study, uterine atony and postpartum hemorrhage was anticipated in 10 to 20%. So you imagine you are in the labor room and you deliver uh, using an assisted vaginal birth, let's say obstetric forceps, then the mom uh, develops shoulder dystocia, you, you resolve shoulder dystocia, and now they are calling you back because there is an atonic uterus and a postpartum hemorrhage. This is a nightmare. And obstetric anal sphincter injury is recorded at around 11%, so you have to be also trained in obstetric anal sphincter repair. Vash and cervical tears, about 4%. Maternal symphysial separation or diastasis with lateral femoral cutaneous neuropathy were in one study reported uh, for the macroperts position. There is a psychological impact of shoulder dystocia, but the available evidence didn't tell us the impact, the extent of this impact. So it should be a hot area for uh, a topic for research. Okay. And financial burden, of course, because that's a lot of medical legal litigation, even years and years after you deliver the baby, the mom and the, the couple or the family may decide to go and sue you. Fetal neonatal complications, brachial plexus injury, most feared and the most common for medical litigation, sometimes as high as 20%. Clavicular fracture, sometimes humeral fracture, these are minor complications. Fetal hypoxia, acidosis, and a brain injury, hypoxic uh, ischemic brain injury, are really very bad outcomes where it results in permanent uh, brain injury or even fetal death in some cases. Just to remind you with the brachial plexus, we have C5, C6 gives us the upper trunk and this is the problem when uh, it happens with the uh, herbs palsy. C8, T1 gives us the lower trunk and this is the problem with the clumpy palsy. I'll just go through it quickly. Herbs palsy, you see disruption of the upper brachial plexus and a posture of abduction and inward rotation at the shoulder, what we call it waiter's tip position. And you could see this lovely girl with a right herbs palsy. Clumpy's palsy, as I mentioned, this happens when there is an in, uh, injury to the lower uh, brachial plexus. It gives you absent grasp reflex of the hand or a claw hand. And the mechanism of injury is very important for you to understand because um, the recent literature, it says that if there is any stretch, tear, compression, or sometimes even avulsion of the nerves, which is, would be associated with permanent brachial plexus injury. So sometimes not all cases of brachial plexus injury will end up in a permanent uh, brachial plexus damage, but if it's only stretch, it might uh, go unnoticed or even very, very mild and it would resolve spontaneously. And to reassure you that this thankfully happened in 90% of the cases, but in about 10% of the cases, we ended up with a, a permanent brachial plexus injury. So you avoid forceful lateral deviation of the head from the shoulders during delivery because you, you would be accused as a uh, uh, obstetric provider that you are the one who pulled hard on the head and you caused the damage. And recent studies also suggest that intrinsic uterine contractions may add to the injury. So what I would advise you, you remain calm when you uh, diagnose shoulder dystocia, ask the mom to stop uh, pushing if you are, if you need some time to enter the vagina, do some maneuvers, or you need some time, don't let the patient to panic and push all the way through. 
and don't pull on the head in the wrong direction. The traction should always be axial. The head is at the direction of the fetal body. It never be um, in the other direction. That's bad. So this is a nice video. It demonstrates how shoulder dystocia happens. I hope you like it. So here is the head, the levers, and the shoulder, the anterior shoulder is stuck behind the symphysis pupus. Here is the obstetric provider trying to do inline traction to diagnose. So gentle inline traction is fine, but if he or she does, does downward traction where the problems show up. So here, this is C5, C6, C7, as I mentioned, the brachial plexus. And when you do downward forceful traction, you ended up with tearing, compressing, or even complete rupture of the nerve, which is associated with permanent injury. So we don't want this ever to happen. So other complication, fracture clavicle. Yes, it's a minor complication. It heals spontaneously. You shouldn't be afraid of clavicular fracture. And um, this is the least to happen in a difficult case. Fetal hypoxia is the most feared hitch shoulder interval. If it exceeds seven minutes, there would be a brain injury. So our aim would be less than five minutes because studies found that umbilical artery pH falls at a constant rate of 0 0.04 per minute following delivery of the head. Although for you who are very updated um, reading about this, you would find that there is an update saying that cases of severe shoulder dissocia are associated with pathological CTGs. They don't follow the same pattern of death. So they are studying this. This area is under study now to make sure that is it constantly uh, dropping and is it like related the brain injury that happens in difficult cases? Is it related to the intraportum events or is it related from uh, antenatally or uh, pathological CTGs developed during intraportum? So what happens is that the umbilical vein get occluded and the compression of the fetal chest results in sequestration of the fetal blood in the placenta and the resultant hypovolemic shock. So they said that the head to body delivery time should be less than five minutes to avoid this. And the most important thing that they found is that those babies would be hypovolemic, so they would benefit from an early intravenous fluids to replace the volume. So although they didn't lose blood, but they, it was sequestrated in the placenta, so they would benefit also. I know that this is a very frightening situation when we are in the labor world and we have this uh, problem and we managed to deliver the baby. We want to cut and clamp the cord, but the evidence is saying that we need to wait and this would need uh, that the resuscitator would be very close to the mom or we could do a skin contact, which is, I know that this is not the case that we are we get panicking and we, we want to deliver, we want to get this baby out, giving them to the uh, neonatal resuscitation team. But they said this baby would benefit from milking of the umbilical cord at least or delayed cord clamping and giving intravenous fluids for the baby early uh, during the resuscitation. So the problem with shoulder dystocia, as I men mentioned, that we cannot predict it. So some babies, 4.5 kilograms or more, they don't develop shoulder dystocia. And some of them, 50% at least, will happen in normal birth weight babies less than four kilograms. And the clinical fetal weight estimation is unreliable. The ultrasound scans have at least 10% margin for error. And it's the sensitivity is very low, just 60% for macrosomic baby. So all of these adds to the, um, to the problem of identification or um, the early recognition. So we should be aware of the existing risk factors. We should address them. We should have a fair and clear and open discussion with the mother during pregnancy about the mode of delivery if there is a previous history of this condition. So always be prepared for shoulder dysphosia in any delivery. So can it be prevented? The prevention, with, let's talk about Elective C-section, the evidence is saying it's not routinely indicated because there would be some cases of shoulder dystocia where it's just very mild and resolved very quickly by macroperts only or macroperts and suprapubic pressure, let's say. So we won't say that elective C-section for any patient who develops shoulder dystocia or if we, the patient is having a macrosomic baby or uh, diabetic. 
glycemic control definitely will help. Controlling the weight before pregnancy and during pregnancy is very important. Some advocate that, you know, delivery in alternative positions, like midwives, sometimes they deliver in the all fours routinely or putting the patient in McRoberts for us would be a um, preventive measure. Yes, sometimes. Previous shoulder dystocia, this is a challenging situation where the mother, she has a baby with a previous shoulder dystocia before, what would be the decision, how to deliver her next time. Actually, the evidence is equivocal. So see, either elective C-section or vag delivery is appropriate after a previous shoulder dystocia and the decision should be made by the woman and her providers. So if the woman has a previous shoulder dystocia, so this depends on the severity of that previous neonatal or the maternal injury, what was the fetal size, what's the current fetal size, what's the maternal preferences, concerns, or choice. So all these factors play together and need, needs a senior input from a senior consultant or a senior obstetrician to talk to the patient and discuss um, things because some of the uh, litigation cases, women, they said that I've never heard about the term shoulder dystocia or my doctor never told me that uh, he didn't offer me or she didn't offer me an elective C-section, for instance, I would have uh, chosen that. So that's important. When it comes to recognition, recognition is very important. How to recognize this case? You do gentle traction. Again, gentle traction, axial traction in line of the head and body together, and it doesn't work. So this is a gentle traction that doesn't work, or you see this sign, turtle sign, not this one, this one. So the head is delivered, it's popping back into the vagina and the shoulders, now you understand that the shoulders are stuck, you call for help, activate institutional protocol, and you start maneuvers. So your goal for the management is to safely deliver the infant before asphyxia and or cortical injury develops, and this would be okay to do so in five minutes. So we do have only five minutes, and we, we need to use them very efficiently. So in Canada, the ALARM course, which is Advanced Labor and Risk Management course, it's a two days course, very intensive course, uh, gives us this alarmer mnemonic. And the mnemonic A stands for ask for help, L for legs, lift, or hyperflex the legs, which is basically McRoberts. Then you go for A, which is anterior shoulder disimpaction, either by suprapubic pressure and or Robin maneuver. Don't worry about that because I'm gonna go and explain each step to you. And the R for rotation of the posterior shoulder, the M for the manual removal of the posterior arm, you consider episiotomy or you roll over onto the all fours as the last option. In the US, in advanced life and support, uh, advanced life support in obstetrics course, it's an American course run by American Academy of Family Physicians, it uses helper mnemonic. So helper H again help, but here they put episiotomy early on after the help, which is like quite early to me, but sometimes, you know, I, I just thought to put, put both mnemonics to you. Then the same idea, legs, macroperts, suprapubic pressure, enter the vagina, roll the patient to hands and knees, remove the posterior arm. So whatever you prefer, you will use, but you're gonna, at all times, the initial maneuver, the initial step in management would be call for help, shout for help, ask for help. You activate an institutional protocol, you appropriately notify everyone, you need you need a resuscitation team, you need extra hands for the macroperts and for the maneuvers, you need anesthetic staff, you need to inform the OR, you need to be, everything should be in mind and should be, you, you need to be very ready for this situation. So I will spend some time explaining to you the tricks, uh, tips and tricks here for the different maneuvers. Macroperts position, for instance, the two mistakes I've seen from teaching or during my practice were that people did do McRoberts or ask for help and the help arrived. They asked two assistants to put the patient in McRoberts by hyperflexing and abducting the, uh, mater abducting the maternal thighs, but they forget to ask the mom to lie flat. So usually when the mom was at this position, she was like 30 degrees, 45 degrees, uh, leaning forward. So you need to not to forget to let the woman lie flat, get the head of the bed very down, let the mother 
be at the edge of the bed. If the bed is not broken, ask for that because that's very important to a successful macrobers. Then you ask the two assistants right and left to hyperflex the thighs onto the maternal abdomen. And this would be very helpful in um, most of the cases. So this is a demonstration to show you what happened when we put patients in macroberts. This is the sacrum, and this is the diagonal orientation of the symphysis pubis. So what we, will happen with the macroberts, that the symphysis will move the cephalt towards the maternal head, and the sacrum will go backward, and the lumbosacral spine is flat. So all of these changes would change the orientation. It doesn't change the functional size of the pelvis though, but it would change the orientation of the maternal pelvis and the fetal shoulder. It will help the anterior fetal shoulder to come underneath the symphysis and be delivered. So if macrobers doesn't work, you should add suprapubic pressure into it. So you ask a third assistant, Definitely not the one who is conducting the delivery right now because you are most probably here doing, trying to try the maneuvers. We have two assistants right and left doing macrobers. You need the third assistant to come where they should stand, to the right or to the left. It depends where the fetal back is. So if the fetal back is to the right side, they would stand on the right side of the patient. If the fetal back is on the left side, they would stand on the left side of the patient because what they want basically do is to come from the posterior aspect of the anterior fetal shoulder and rotate this stuck shoulder downwards under the symphysis and to laterally, to the other side. So if the head is looking at this, you would rotate the baby towards this direction because if the head is looking that way, the back is on this side. So that's the idea of the uh, suprapubic pressure. So you remember we called for help, we assigned the team, and we need someone who is uh, responsible about documentation. And this person, they should call out every 30 to 60 seconds, telling us that 30 seconds passed, 60 seconds passed, because this is very crucial when it comes, because sometimes we lose the track of time, and this is uh, not really good if we lose the track of time and, and try to focus on one maneuver to the other. We need to move on from different maneuvers successfully, like uh, serially, in order to make the delivery successful. So again, this is the idea of the suprapubic pressure. Just to let you know that suprapubic pressure is called Robin 1, because I'm going to talk about Robin 2 later. And Robin 1 and Robin 2 share the same idea. So you need to remember that suprapubic pressure is Robin 1. So that's a short video, very helpful letting us understand how suprapubic pressure works to relieve or alleviate shoulder dystocia. So you ask an assistant in a CPR hand position, like we do the CPR, comes from the side of the fetal back and press downwards and laterally, rotating this shoulder to the oblique diameter. Remember, problems and litigation comes when you do the bad traction, the, the not the axial traction, the not gentle traction when you combine it with fundal pressure. So I'm going to spend the, for a few minutes, you know, talking about the bad fundal pressure and what it's uh, bad for shoulder dystocia cases. So never to do fundal pressure, and here's why. This is a case of shoulder dystocia again, head delivered, shoulders are stuck, someone is doing fundal pressure here. What will happen? Get a closer look and see. This is what will happen. Bad traction, downward traction associated with fundal pressure leading to damage to the brachial plexus. So the initial maneuvers I talked about by putting the patient in proper macroverts and doing suprapubic pressure, you resolve 80 to 90% of the cases. So 90% of the cases, we don't need the rest of the slides. But in 10% only, the most difficult, challenging, severe cases of shoulder dystocia, we will need more than this. So it, the, the E comes for evaluation for episiotomy. As I mentioned, it's a bony impaction. It's not a soft tissue problem. So episiotomy is not necessary in all cases, but you need to make your mind 
early on and you decide based on the clinical judgment and how difficult the delivery is, what's the size of the baby, what's the size of the mom. And you, if you feel that you need extra space, to use your hands, enter the vagina, deliver the posterior arm or do the enter maneuvers, you would definitely need a good generous episiotomy. So at this point, you either you, you go and deliver the posterior arm or you proceed to rotation maneuvers. What I felt is that North American practice would go for delivery of the posterior arm. When I was in Ireland, it, we go for the rotational maneuvers first before delivery of the posterior arm, but it's at the discretion of the obstetric providers because it depends on how, what's your level of comfort, what's your level of training with those maneuvers and the evidence. Uh, there is no uh, procedure or, sorry, um, like intervention superior to the other. So either to deliver the posterior arm or you go and you do the rotational maneuvers, both are the same results. So removal of the posterior arm, you follow the posterior arm down to the elbow. Now, another trick I'm um, uh, I need to tell you about that you Two things. The first thing, when you want to introduce your hand inside the vagina, you use your cup hand. You would never use the thumb like this. You'd use your hand like a Pringle. You insert it inside the vagina in the posterior, in the hollow of the sacrum. So the sacral hollow is your key to the vagina because that's the widest part. So you insert your hand on the posterior vaginal wall and here you follow the posterior arm of the baby down to the elbow, you will usually find it anterior to the chest. If you couldn't find it, if you find it beside the body, you would just flex it by pressing on the cubital fossa. Then you hand, you grasp the forearm, not the handle, not to injure the baby. You, sw you, you, you swipe it across the chest and you deliver the posterior arm. So that's the idea of delivering the posterior arm. You never grasp the hand, as I mentioned, because you might lead to, to fractures. So here, what I was telling you that you insert hand, this is a wrong one though. I just put the slides to show you. You cannot put your finger like this. What's recommended that you cup your finger in a Pringle way, like you insert it, you cup it inside, you put your thumbs inside your hand, you insert it in the sacral hollow and you reach to try to reach the posterior arm. If it's not flexed, you apply pressure on the anti-cubital fossa, like you try it on yourself. If you apply pressure here, this would be flexed. When it's flexed, you slide your hand, you reach to the uh, forearm, then you swipe it across the chest and you deliver. That's the idea of delivery of the posterior arm. Then by then, when you deliver the posterior arm, now the diameter would be 20% less. And instead of the piece acromial diameter, you are 20% less than this diameter and you could do the um, delivery easy. Yeah, so that's a small video about the delivery of the posterior arm. Yes, you insert, if it's not flexed, you flex it, you swipe it across the chest, you get it out. Then you deliver the baby. There is another new technique, it's actually like four or five years now, called posterior accelerated sling traction. The, the only drawback of this, of using this technique is uh, that you apply more pressure on the posterior shoulder and posterior arm that you result usually in humeral fracture. But if you compare humeral fracture to the risk of the baby being dying during this birth or uh, developing a permanent brain injury, you would say, I would choose humeral fracture. So what will happen that you get a feeding tube, you try to pass it uh, under the axilla of the baby from the posterior shoulder, you, you pass it the other way, then you grasp it with a clamp, then you apply traction force on this clamp to deliver the posterior fetal shoulder. So instead, this is important when you don't find the space inside the mom to go and do all the previous maneuvers to deliver the posterior arm. You could use the posterior axillary sling traction, but you got to bear in mind that you, this is associated with a higher risk of humeral uh, fracture. 
So that's a link on the YouTube. I won't open it now, but I would send it with uh, my set of slides if you want to see how to demonstrate the posterior axillary sling traction. So now the delivery of the posterior arm, either uh, using your hands or using the uh, sling traction failed. What are you going to do? Your options now is to enter the vagina and do the internal rotational maneuvers. So internal rotational maneuvers, we have three of them. The first uh, internal rotational maneuver is called Robin 2. And Robin 2, if you remember the slide when I told you, remember that Robin 1 is suprapubic pressure. What we do in the suprapubic pressure that we press on the posterior aspect of the anterior fetal shoulder and we try to rotate it externally to the oblique diameter. We do the same, but from inside the vagina. So we enter the vagina on the anterior, on the, sorry, on the posterior aspect of the anterior fetal shoulder, and we, we exert pressure trying to dislodge this anterior fetal shoulder, bring it to the oblique diameter and delivering the baby. So this is what I mean. Here, the head is delivered, shoulders are stuck. You enter the vagina, you put your two fingers on the posterior aspect of the anterior fetal shoulder. I will tell you another trick of mine, like I find it more easier to get my hand from the posterior here, from the uh, sacral hollow, and slide it up the back to the posterior aspect of the anterior fetal shoulder. Because sometimes if the patients, especially with those who are having narrow pubic arch, it's very difficult to insert the two fingers on the posterior aspect of anterior fetal shoulder. But I find it easier if I go from the sacral hollow, slide my hand up, 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 until I reach the posterior aspect of the anterior fetal shoulder and do the rotation to bring it down the symphysis and to the oblique diameter and deliver the baby. So this is what we call Robin 2 because as I told you, Robin 1, we were doing the same, but externally from above. Now we are entering the vagina and doing it from down below. So it's the Robin 2. Then you deliver the baby. If it fails, you might help yourself by Wood's screw. So Wood's screw is uh, getting to the anterior aspect of the posterior fetal shoulder. So you put two fingers. This is the hand that did Robin 2. And this is the hand that will get for the Woods screw. Woods screw, I will come to the anterior aspect of posterior fetal shoulder. And this is on the posterior aspect of anterior fetal shoulder. And I'm trying to help myself to dislodge this baby, bring it to the oblique diameter and deliver. So here you could, this is the anterior shoulder. This is posterior shoulder. You come anterior to posterior and posterior to anterior and try to dislodge this impacted shoulders, bring it to the oblique diameter because this is the idea and deliver the baby. If it fails, what are you going to do? You're gonna use the other hand, the opposite hand, and you do reverse woods screw. And in reverse woods screw, you need to put two fingers on the posterior aspect of the posterior fetal shoulder. So this is posterior of the posterior, posterior aspect of posterior fetal shoulder. You wanna do the rotation in the reverse direction to the woods screw and Robins too, in order to get the baby 180 degrees and deliver this impacted baby. So you come from behind in the sacral hollow again, you put your two fingers on the posterior aspect of the posterior fetal shoulder, you rotate this baby 180 degrees and you deliver the baby. If all of the above mentioned measures fail, most probably you are now four minutes or three or four minutes past, you roll the patient, use the midwife Gaskin maneuver, you roll to the old force, and she said that if the evidence is saying that, you know, this increases pelvic diameters, gravity would help, changing the maternal position might help the dislodging of the impaction. Midwives are like a lot of, <laughs> more than us, more trained on delivering patients in this position. For me, it's kind of scary or I am not well trained to deliver in this position, but it works, especially with difficult cases. But for us, the difficulties come, uh, come with uh, the patient hooked up to monitors. What if the patient on epidural anesthesia, like there are some difficulties to perform this in hospital setting, but I'm saying if it's a last resort, we could uh, do it. So this is a uh, Gaskin. The patient was lying flat or in her um, 
back, then we flip it over to the uh, all fours and deliver in this position. And remember that in this position, you could also repeat the enter maneuvers. You could repeat the enter maneuvers here. Or uh, if you want to deliver, you are delivering which uh, shoulder here? The shoulder facing the ceiling because it doesn't matter to call it anterior or posterior, it's confusing. So you deliver the shoulder facing the ceiling. So you enter your hands and you do the same Robin two woods screw or reverse woods screw. So if after five minutes, we know for sure that either this baby it has a, is going to have a bad outcome or the baby is dead and we want a last resort maneuver it would be these maneuvers. I won't spend time because in a developed country like Canada, I'm not expecting that we reach this point, but what if this patient is coming from a rural area or this patient is uh, referred to us after the midwife has been trying for the past 10 minutes, for instance, 